All right, well, this morning I am extremely excited because we're starting a new series. We're going to walk through First and Second Peter together. Two books that are just absolutely phenomenal. I love them dearly. Um, however, they're very challenging books. And what I mean by that is if I want to be encouraged, I usually run and read First and Second Thessalonians. Those are encouraging books. First and Second Peter are kind of a buckle up. It might get rough, but God is good. So why don't we do this? Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 together. Let's read through the scripture and let's see what God has for us this morning. First, let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth and the knowledge and the wisdom it contains. Lord, thank you that you know the end from the beginning. Thank you that you love us so much that you died for us in spite of us. Lord, and we just ask that you'd open our hearts to hear from you this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, let's start. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus, Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Well, I guess before we get into what that means, we've got to figure out who's writing this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Well, let's, let's, who's Peter? Who's Peter? The apostle Peter also known as Simon Peter, also known as Cephas, former fisherman, brother of Andrew, denied Christ, you remember that story, became a largely influential part of the early church at Jerusalem, and he's writing from Rome. His ministry to the Jews was second to none, whereas Paul was sent to the Gentiles Peter was sent to the Jews. And, and we know it was written in Rome because in chapter 5, verse 13, he says he's at Babylon, which was understood very much to be Rome at that time. Um, you know, the book of Revelation and several contemporary Jewish works at that time also refer to Rome that way. So that's, that's why we think that. It also matches the idea that Rome was part of the four kingdoms, which was an ex extension of Alexander the Great's empire that was predicted in Daniel. Okay, so we've got an idea of who Peter is. He's, he's the apostle, the one who denied Christ, the one who was brought back, um, who was told, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. But who is he writing to? Well, it says in there he's writing to the diaspora. Written, the letter's written to strangers, to aliens, to sojourners, to pilgrims. And you'll see a map here, what it means, the, the, the diaspora is the dispersion. In verse 1, when it says it's written to the elect exiles, which will be echoed again in 2.11. So, oh boy, elect exiles, that's a, a whole lot to unpack. But when we read the scripture, we've got to be careful not to do something. We've got to be careful not to do what's called eisegesis, which means reading our thoughts and our meanings and our preconceived notions into the word. So this, this idea of elect exiles can carry a whole bunch of baggage with it unless you understand who Peter is and who he's writing to, what he's trying to accomplish. When Peter speaks of the elect here, He's talking about God's chosen people. Elect means chosen. But when you think about God's chosen people throughout all the scripture, who is, who is usually being talked about? It's the Jews, Israel, right? So Peter, being the apostle to the Jews, is writing to the Jews who have been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, who have been exiled from Jerusalem, who have been spread out across across the known world. So this group of Jewish exiles is known as the diaspora or the dispersion. And it's kind of cool to think how God used those people, 
how he spread the Jews to different places around the Roman Empire. And that exile they had was to be a mechanism for the church's growth. And what I mean by that is, where did Paul go when he went to share the gospel? He started out in the Jewish synagogues. You see that in Acts. From, from town to town he went. He started out in the synagogues, shared the gospel with the Jews, and some would come with him, some would, would reject him, and when they rejected him, then that opened the door for preaching to the Gentiles. So God's word and God's salvation was made available to everyone. It's kind of cool. Now, Peter wrote to the Jews. He's writing to the believing Jews, but obviously this church was being written to churches in Asia Minor um, and all through the empire. It was, it's conceivable that obviously Gentile Christians would be reading this as well. So we've got a mixture of Jews and Gentiles in the churches. And through that, Christians were scattered in different parts of the Roman Empire. You know, another thought at Pentecost, the Jews heard the gospel preached in their own languages, probably went back home and, and shared it once again. So throughout this book, and in thinking of these Jews being exiled, they, they were going through suffering and persecution. Peter refers to this throughout the book at least 15 times. They're suffering for doing good. They have reproach for believing in Christ. But even more specifically, we have to remember that in 64 AD, much of Rome burned to the ground. You've probably heard this, you know, Emperor Nero playing his violin as the city burned. Well, there's debate on whether or not Nero actually set fire to the city. Um, some people will say he did so to rebuild it in his own image and, and how he wanted it. Some will pay, people will say it was an accident. Um, what's funny is the whole city, except for Nero's and his older boyfriend Tigellinus' estates were burned. So just a little suspicious. I wasn't there, I don't know, but just a little suspicious. That said, someone had to be the scapegoat. Someone had to take responsibility for who burnt this town to the ground. Who better than the Christians? You see, in, in ancient Rome, there was no political reason not to blame the Christians. Even the Jews, who were thought of as atheists because they rejected the Roman pantheon, were still held in higher regard than the Christians, who were thought to be just a weird offshoot of Judaism. The Romans thought Christianity was a terrible and even incestuous philosophy. And what I mean by that is they heard people say things like, I love you, brother, and I love you, sister. They couldn't understand it because they don't understand what Christian love is, and, and they didn't understand the fact that we're all part of God's family once we've accepted Christ. So we'll see in a few verses that this, this letter is being read by a persecuted people. Peter talks about the fiery trial ahead, which was, to be sure, official persecution from the Roman Empire. And so when Peter references it, it's not just persecution like being made fun of online or having bad things said about you. Don't get me wrong, the people who say these things against Christians today should absolutely be prayed for. We need to love those people. We need to lovingly call them to repentance in Christ. And the reason we need to do that is because it's a very short hop, skip, and a jump from these people are bigots to violence against bigots is always justified. So we need to pray. But we need to understand, too, we haven't come near what persecution for these early believers looked like. The Jewish historian Tacitus records that Nero used to burn Christians at the stake to light his parties. Or he'd throw them to wild animals in the arena for the entertainment of his citizens. So, when you hear the fiery trial, and Peter's referencing this, not only the burning of Rome, but the burning of Christians, we need to read Peter's encouragement to stand firm with that in mind. Suffering runs through this letter. But so does glory. Assurance that suffering will be transformed into glory. 
And Peter reminds his saints of a living hope. In 1 Peter 5.12, skipping ahead several chapters, it says, I've written to you briefly encouraging you I'm sorry. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I've written t- briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So he's written briefly, encouraging us and testifying that this is the true grace of God. We need to hold firm. Also see here that Silas or Silvanus acted as a scribe for him writing this letter. Which makes sense because he was a fisherman, not a philosopher. So, Big picture, we'll see three themes show up. First, suffering will come for the believer. But God's grace is our refuge because we who are in Christ have a living hope. So let's work again through the first 12 verses together and see how it all works. So once again, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay. So... Peter's writing to these dispersed Jews. He's referring to them again as the elect because of Israel's position as God's chosen people through whom God would bring the Savior to make salvation available to all who would place their faith in him. It says, according to the foreknowledge of God, once again, God's plan to save humanity involved his chosen people. His promise to Abraham guaranteed that the Messiah would come from this specific line thousands of years before Christ was born. Our election involves the Trinity. We see the Father's love and foreknowledge. We see the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify, and we see the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkling us for forgiveness of sins. So what's our part? Our part is just to hear and believe the gospel. Over and over throughout the scripture, over and over, we're told that we, all we must do To be saved is to believe in Christ. But I want to be clear. This isn't just intellectual assent. No one is saved because they think Jesus existed. Many, many, many atheists will agree that Jesus was an actual person who lived in first century Israel. The most respected atheist scholars in the world, if they're intellectually honest, will say, yeah, absolutely, he was a real man. I just don't believe that he came back from the dead or he was God. There's a big difference in believing something exists and believing in someone, as in placing your faith in them. I like to use the analogy, if you'll turn your attention to the chair you're sitting in right now. Okay? As a rather large man, I've broken my fair share of chairs. Okay? Anyone relate to that? No? Okay. I love you, Jake. I refuse (laughs) to buy or sit in plastic lawn chairs because so many have let me down. (laughs) So for me, I can read the label on a chair, right? I can measure the scientific properties. I can see it says it'll hold 400 pounds. Well, (laughs) we'll see. I can do my own calculations, right? I can read reviews. I can even see someone else sitting in the chair. But until I decide to commit my safety, my well-being, my comfort, and well, depending on how catastrophically it fails, maybe my very life, into that chair. Until I sit down in that chair, I don't have faith, do I? But once I decide to act on that evidence that I've seen, Even though the chair may fail and I sit in it, then I have faith. Praise God that Christ is more reliable than the chairs that I've sat in. It's much the same with him, though, isn't it? You can intellectually assent as much as you want 
to the fact of Jesus Christ. But until you decide to give your life into his hands and to truly trust him for your salvation, you're not resting on what he's done. You're resting in your own ability, and therefore you're not saved. So if you get nothing else from this morning, that's what I would, I would hope you get. If you're not trusting in him, if you haven't placed your life into him, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, you need to do so. In, t- in verse 3, Peter continues. And by the way, if I say Paul, please forgive me, I mean Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So why do we have that living hope? Because it's made possible by the living Son of God, whom Peter saw raised from the dead. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope, he says. Peter's referring to Christ's conversation with Nicodemus in John 3. We must be born again to see the kingdom of God. So when we accept Christ, we become a new creation. We've talked about this, but in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, We who are born to a living hope, a Savior who died, rose again, who reigns eternally. Once we're in him, we're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And this is what chiefly separates Christianity from every other religion. Christ alone conquered the grave. So we're born again to a living, eternal hope through Christ's resurrection. Continuing on in verse 4, Peter says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We talked about this a few weeks ago when when discussing the Holy Spirit, but look, here's another wonderful passage about eternal security. We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is so unlike an earthly inheritance. Nothing can ruin it. It can't be stained or cheapened in any way. It can't wear out. It can't break. It can't dissolve. What's this salvation to be revealed? Don't we already have salvation? Well, yeah, we're saved through faith in Christ, but the completion of that salvation awaits the returning of the Savior to make all things right. When we receive those new bodies, we enter a new environment, which is heaven itself. This is the appearing of Christ, it says, the blessed hope. What we long for and we look forward to as Christians is our risen Lord returning. So our inheritance and our salvation is guarded by the power of God. It's guarded, it's shielded, it's, it's constant, and we have assurance that we will safely arrive in heaven. We're not guarded by our own strength or power, but by his faithfulness. And what a joy that is, because if it depended on us, we'd never get there, but it depends on his finished work on the cross. So what Peter's talking about here, as he speaks to his predominantly Jewish audience, is the total salvation that they've been expecting, both physically and eternally, when Christ returns and rights all wrongs. Continuing on in verse 6, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So everything that God is planning and performing here is in preparation for what he has in store for us in heaven. We might have trials. We may have been grieved by various trials. Peter here says, it's going to be rough. We don't just put the happy all the time face on. B 
being grieved by trials means it's going to be rough. They're not intended to be easy. They're heavy, they're painful, and they're difficult. Sometimes God may even keep us in a trial to prove our faith. What I mean by this is a goldsmith, as he's talking about gold and and how it's refined, a goldsmith will not deliberately waste that precious ore. So one of my favorite analogies in scripture about what God does with our hearts. The goldsmith puts it in the hottest part of the fire long enough to remove the impurities so that they float to the top and that he can scrape off the dross, that which isn't usable, that which isn't pure. And he keeps repeating the process until he sees his reflection in the molten metal and then he can shape it to his purposes. God wants us to reflect his glory. He wants us to reflect his glory, not just in the good times, but especially in going through trials so that he can shape us into people who reflect him to the world so that we can be used for his purposes. So what does Peter say is the thing that's more precious than gold here? I owe Paul a great debt of gratitude here. We talked about this in our discussions about Greek, but but the language lends itself to say that it's not the faith that's the precious thing, it's the tested genuineness of that faith that's the precious thing. God wants a sincere faith. It's been said that a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And if someone abandons the faith when they're going through tough times, it's only proven that they never had said faith. More likely, just an intellectual assent. More than likely, it was just based on good feelings they had. God wants sincere faith regardless of the circumstances. And and this thought flies in the face of prosperity theology that says God's job is to provide us with health, wealth, and happiness while we're here on this earth that we can live our best life in the here and now instead of looking forward to our best life in heaven. When speaking at the University of Central Florida, John Piper said this in regards to the so-called prosperity gospel. He said, I'll tell you what makes Jesus look beautiful. It's when you smash your car and your little girl goes flying through the windshield and lands dead on the street and you say, through the deepest possible pain, God is enough. Perhaps that's over the top. Perhaps you don't want to think about that. But can you imagine what these first century Christians who were strapped to stakes and lit on fire for the entertainment of desperately wicked people would think of prosperity preachers telling them that maybe if they had a little more faith, they'd be healthy and wealthy, not being burned alive? Can you imagine the families of the Christians thrown to the lions in the arena hearing that God wants them to be rich beyond their wildest dreams if they'll just sow a seed of a thousand dollars. What makes Jesus look beautiful to the world is when we live our faith and reflect the character of God through the trials we will face and not because those trials are absent. You catch that? In verse 8, Peter says this. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We live by faith, not by sight. We don't see Christ, but we have a relationship with him. When Christ is speaking to Thomas in John chapter 28, 20, verses 28 and 29, he says, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. We know his word is truth. And and in faith, we've got to surrender all of our lives, 
all we are to God. We've got to obey his word despite circumstances and despite temporal consequences. We need to find our sustenance in the word. And in spite of the trials, we can rejoice by centering our hearts and minds on Jesus. As we exercise love, faith, and rejoicing, then we can experience heaven on earth. That's how we live our best life is we understand that it's not here. Not in our material possessions, but in a greater closeness to our Savior. In a more intimate relationship with him and the amazing joy of being around others who know Jesus and love him like he loves us. Just as we love them in the same way. You know, Spurgeon regarded by many as the prince of preachers because of his enormous body of work and his inimitable style, said this. I said, a little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will be, bring heaven to your soul. As Jesus said, it takes only the faith of a mustard seed to move mountains. But imagine what a growing, vibrant, living and active faith will mean for those of us who do know him. Continuing on, Peter says this, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who have preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So what that passage is saying there, he's saying the prophets who wrote knew that they were writing about the Messiah. They were looking forward to him, but they didn't know exactly how their writings would apply. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen. They were looking for this Messiah they knew certainly that he would suffer, that he would die. They knew he'd be glorified. But as with most, most prophecy, it only truly makes sense when we're looking back on it. Now that we're on the other side, we can look back and see, oh, wow, God exactly predicted that. I wouldn't have gotten that just by reading it, but now that I look at it, it fits perfectly. We can see what was clearly meant by the suffering servant. We can see the virgin birth. We can see the fact that his wounds healed us. Not physically healed us from every malady, but spiritually healed us from our deadness to sin. I was reading in Craig Keener's Bible background commentary that Jewish tradition held that God kept things even from the angels because they were so important. And in other Jewish traditions, it was thought that angels may even have been jealous of the people of Israel because they received the law and the promises and eventually the Messiah. But all in all, what Peter's saying here is that we are a people most blessed because the Holy Spirit preached these things to men long ago, but we're the ones who get to enjoy their fulfillment through faith in Christ. That's pretty cool. So, putting a bow on it, wrapping it all up. What does this mean for us? First, we will suffer. As believers in Christ, we will face trials. It's not going to be happy all the time. We can't ignore it. We can't deny it. So what we need to do instead is look for the good that God has for us in that suffering the fact that we can lean on him, that we can run to him, that we can rest in him, and that his grace is sufficient. We need to understand that we've been forgiven eternally for our sin through faith in Jesus, and that suffering produces a tested faith that shows the world God's character so that we can share that living hope that we have in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for who you are once again. Thank you that we have a living hope, 
Thank you that unlike every other system, we serve a risen Lord, a living God. Lord, thank you so much that your finished work on the cross is what saves us, none of our works. Thank you that it doesn't depend on me, that it doesn't depend on any of us. Lord, thank you that you loved us so much that you came and lived that perfect life in our place, that you died the death we deserve, and that you rose again once and for all, defeating death and claiming the victory for all who would believe. I pray here and now that as we go this week that we would be looking for people who need to hear this. People who need to understand that if they're suffering, it's because it's testing their faith. That it's producing something amazing in them. Lord, and I pray that you would be working in the hearts of those who are so enthralled by the idea of prosperity theology that 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 they've traded the idea of a vibrant and active and living God for maybe I can get some more money while I'm here. We pray for them. We pray that they would be convicted of their sin, that they would have their eyes opened and come to you for you, not for fringe benefits while they're on this planet. Lord, you're so good and so gracious and so wonderful. We lift all these prayers up in your son's holy name. Amen.